I'm Johanna, welcome to my channel. Today I wanted to run through some of my top smoking gun evidence that I found that have convinced me that there was definitely undiscovered ancient technology, either attributed to the Egyptians or a previous civilization that we have yet to discover. So first on the list are these incredible stone pots. Don't mistake these for pottery. They are not made from anything wet and molded. These are carved out of stone, incredibly hard stone. They are almost perfectly formed. They are uniform, they are symmetrical. They, they look machine made. Even the experts are completely stumped as to how these pots were made. They found about 40,000 of these pots buried at Saqqara. They date to really, really early in the Egyptian dynasties. And what's really weird is they are the most perfect, most accurate, most symmetrical, most beautiful pots. And they were found only and exclusively in the earliest periods of Egypt. They were never replicated. The Egyptians from the later dynasties could never accurately copy these original pots. To me, that screams that either the first dynasties of Egypt had a different understanding of technology and had a completely different technological advancement that they did not pass on and progress into later dynasties of Egypt, or they inherited these pots from a previous civilization and incorporated them into their culture. And of course, that's why they couldn't pass on the knowledge because it wasn't them that made it. And here in the Cairo Museum, you can see these are the lids, the Egyptian made lids that coincided with the stone pots. And the whole thing just looks a bit laughable, really. So these are the lids <laughs> that they made for those stone pots. If you, if you could make the pot to that level of accuracy, of the same accuracy, of the same structure and format, it just, it seems a bit weird that the lid does not match the base. And for anyone thinking that these are somehow like a geopolymer pot or they, they melted down the stone and put it into some sort of mold, you can literally see up close these sort of styrations that they made to cut into the stone. This stone is incredibly hard, it is incredibly delicate and fragile. They had the ability to not only carve stone, but also carve it in in like flexible, like look at this, look at the angles and this thing is, is like paper thin. Now the only reason why these stone pots are even dated to the early dynasties is because very crudely scratched into them are names and cartouches which sort of date it to that period. So in Egyptology the only reason why anything is dated to the time period that it is, is based on whatever name is carved into that object. For example, this statue in the Cairo Museum, this was one of my biggest smoking guns of the fact that we should not date objects or artifacts or buildings purely on the names that are tagged onto them. Look at this statue, it's, it's eerily made, the stone is so hard. This statue is attributed to an early dynasty, I, I think, third or fourth dynasty and the only reason it is attributed to them is look at the scratchings and I will say scratchings on the base of this beautifully carved I honestly feel like this artifact was inherited I would bet money that they are not the same person and they are not from the same time frame just saying so these are the tools that we found all the tools that could have possibly made these artifacts and it just doesn't work and here again at Karnak, you can see these huge granite statues, uh, which seem to have cartouches kind of slapped on. And you can see that they even, they're put on in a way that actually goes over the top of the original design of the statue. <laughs> that name was not designed to be put on the statue in that place. And some of the statues are missing cartouches altogether. So that makes me believe that the cartouches were added later and these huge granite stone statues may not have been made in that time frame. Now, this smoking gun isn't a particular object or place in general. It's just a theme that definitely stuck out to me when I was traveling around Egypt. And the theme is just precision made, often a lot darker, blacker 
granite and harder stones, the harder stones to work with that are made the most precise, symmetrical, laser precision ways, I think that we can see, you can clearly see a totally different style from the Assyrian. When you group all of these things together, it creates a huge mood board for a culture that I think predates the first dynasties of Egypt. And the theme of this incredible stone workers, I think is most prominent in the Serapium. You go underground in Saqqara and you find these absolutely huge granite stone boxes that are made with such precision. It looks like a modern day machine has cut them. But what's even more baffling is that modern day granite workers, they would have no idea on how to construct one of these today from one block of granite. The most that they could do would be make it out of five pieces and bolt them together. Whoever made these boxes, they had a knowledge of working with and cutting granite that is better than our best minds today. And that for me proves that we shouldn't look at people in the past as being less than us or less developed or less advanced. They beat us in this one, we have to give them this. Again, nearly all of the boxes in the Serapium are a beautiful, pristine, unmarked. There are one or two boxes that have been glyphed on. They've been glyphed. And the quality of the markings is nothing like the symmetry and quality of the actual boxes themselves. I would bet my left leg that somebody came along later, the Egyptians came along later, found this site and tried to tag it for themselves. These boxes are phenomenally huge. Uh, this is me uh, on the box, just for size reference. I'm not that big. And to add to the mystery of how they were made, the even bigger mystery is how did they get them underground? The weight of these things are tons and tons and tons. They would take at least 300 men just to budge these things. Look at the tiny tunnels that they were put down. You can't fit barely 10 people in a, in a line side by side. How would you get 300 men? It's a mystery, and the mystery for me flags ancient technology. Oh wow, it's like... It has green, and it has purple, and it has black. Wow. So this is not basalt? No, this is not basalt. This is more solid than basalt. This is... <gasps> so glossy. 6.5? This is 7, and solid 7. Yeah. This, kind of... I, this for me is not looking like even a saw, but it's looking more like the Dremel tool. And we will see something similar to this when we are in Abu Rawash. For me, the top site in Egypt to see ancient technology evidence would be at Abu Sir. It's a site that isn't open to the public. I don't know why it isn't open to the public, and maybe one of the reasons it isn't is because of all the crazy evidence that is there. We saw a whole amazing mishmash of different types of rock and stonework and uh, calisite crystal altars. All over the site, you can find these tube drill holes. Different sizes, some of them super impressive, super precise. Now, the argument is, it is technically possible to do a tube drill hole using a very old method of using sand and water and, and an old school kind of hand machine. It, it is possible, I've seen it done on a small scale. However, if you look more into the, to the arguments made by Christopher Dunn, it is these particular styrations, the marks that are left in the stone that hold huge flags to say that that was not the method that was used in this particular instance because the styrations for both they don't match i'm not a stonemason i find it very hard to see the difference but the people who do know what they're talking about they bet their career on what they're talking about and uh, a lot of the guys on the trip with me were they were just having their mind blown all over the gaff about what these styrations mean. This one here, for example, uh, they were so impressed because the saw that would have had to cut through that granite would have had to have been moving at speed, a speed that is just so much faster than a human hand could be using 
a human hand could be using? That's not English. Whatever the tool was, it is not known to date what it was. And even the mainstream Egyptologists, they just put massive question marks over this stuff and go, mm, we don't know. Um, and the very fact that Egyptologists and historians are happy to go, we don't know what made this actually, but we don't really care, that bothers me. And then of course, huge smoking gun, the huge saw marks in, in the, the ancient granite. Again, the only tools that historians say at this time period was available were hand tools and sort of copper chisels. The precision that this saw mark, I've, I saw so many saw marks in the granite all over the place there. Uh, and not just saw marks, but saw mistakes, which again can only be explained by some tool moving through the rock at speed. If you're chiseling something by hand, you're going at millimeter pace. So for you to make a mistake that's a couple of inches long, you would have have to have been making a mistake for days on end before you even realized. So, this, in my opinion, Dr. Zaha Hawass is in the field. <laughs> okay, so we can see the striations. Hmm? Clearly, the cut ended here, mm -hmm. but we can see that it's not a, a flat surface. So, we, if this was part of a box, then this was an inside cut. You can imagine that this used to be another piece like that here or that the, it was quarried from something else or it was even a corner so it's an inner cut which make it even harder to have a saw cutting this way hmm? yeah but on a smaller scale i would see figures like this if i using my six millimeter dremel tool Mm -hmm. uh, spinning like uh, a cone shape, not a cone shape, but like a circular one that is straight and I will be like, it will be rotating for example like that and I will be moving with it like mm -hmm. will give very similar figures this is, for me, is the closest oh. the closest result on the stone yeah. Of course, if you are familiar with the uh, research of uh, Christopher Dunn, so I believe the pit here could be used for uh, a giant saw, but I don't like the drawings because they put the piece of stone in the bottom of the pit. That would be a very hard challenge. <laughs> No, is it all? Is it? No, it's not very sharp knives, but you're in the room. Wow. Cool. Wow. <laughs> so, this chef we used to look at from above. It's hot. Yeah. Hot air. Wow. That's so cool. Oh, there's lots of bats. Lots of bats. No problem. No problem. It's good. Yes, good bats. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. That's good. Good bats. <laughs> I don't know, but the bats are flying around like cray cray. Wow, this is all underneath the pyramid. That's crazy. This is crazy. It's beautiful. It's hot. Oh, wow. Wow. This is okay. This is a tomb down here and 
this around. Shift and this around. Yes. Whoa. This is the most precise granite box found in Egypt and it's way underground in a pyramid and this box was different to any other box. The level of precision and mathematics was insane. The, the corners of inside the box and out were perfect uh, to, to within 0.0.0.0.1% 0 .0 .0 .0 of accuracy. You could even fit the corner of a ballpoint pen uh, inside the, the corners of, of this box. It was it was pretty impressive considering, again, it's supposed to have been made by a hand tool. It's polished and thousands and thousands of years later, it looks brand new. Uh, what was also crazy about this box is that it was unusual because it was on an angle. It's actually on a diagonal. I don't know why, but obviously it's made like that for a reason. Um, and so these all these precise lines and angles are even more impressive considering the bottom of it is on the wonk. So there we are. There are a few of my top smoking guns from what I've seen and why I am convinced that we do not have all of the answers and that at least, at minimum, uh, there is technology lost to us that should be attributed to the Egyptians, or these objects have been passed down and attributed to them incorrectly. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and press the little bell button so that you're notified whenever I drop a vid, which is normally every Sunday. Any questions, comments and concerns, please leave them in the comments. I like to jump in and make friends with you lot. I'll see you next week.